Okay, so let's go. Let's go. Okay, so I'm Shoikot, and I'm going to be talking about reaction diffusion systems, so waves, fronts, and pattern formation. Now, uh, pattern formation is a very interdisciplinary topic, and it's a very well studied topic. And I'm I'm not I'm not saying at all that I'm going to cover everything because it's a very vast field, and there is a there are lots of people who are working on this. I'm just going to cover some interesting problems that I have done in during my PhD. And uh, just, just the, my discussion will be very qualitative, just to introduce you to the uh, to the problem, to some of the concepts. And by the end of this talk, I'll be really glad if you learn some vocabulary and some uh, knowledge about the systems and how to solve them. So that would that that's all uh, my aim is really. Uh, I don't expect you to go and solve a um, you know a partial differential equation or something like that. So uh, just just to get some kind of vocabulary and some kind of sense of these systems, that's all I want from my talk. Okay, so uh, pattern formation, of course, we have lots of interesting patterns. What we see here are simulations that I have done. And I am basically a simulation person. I do computer simulations. Uh, I basically solve partial differential equations in a computer, and then I study uh, those systems. So what we see here in the left and the right are basically convection uh, domains. So we are basically seeing the temperature field in Rayleigh-Bernard convection. The leftmost is a spiral. So basically what happens in a convection cell, and we are gonna uh, come uh, later on in this talk, in a convection cell, if you see it from above, after there is uh, after there are convection rows, if you see the domain from above, or if you take a slice in the mid plane, you actually kind of see interesting patterns. And the patterns can be different things. So this is a giant spiral that's been induced here by some hot uh, sidewall conditions. And that's that's just a, a detail you don't need to worry about. But this is a spiral that's rotating. And you can see there is a defect here dislocation that's rotating as well. Now, these are colors of temperature, where temperature T of 1 is basically hot fluid, and T of 0 is cold fluid. T, the temperature is normalized or scaled. So T of 1 is the highest temperature in the domain and P of zero is the lowest temperature. Similarly here, this is a simulation of spiral defect chaos. This is also from a convective flow field. And here what happens is that these kind of spirals, they, there are many of such spirals, they interact and uh, they form uh, structures and uh, which are spatio which can be spatiotemporally quote unquote chaotic. And what I mean by chaotic, I will also come to that uh, later on um, in the slides. Now, these two images on the right, or these two movies, are basically fronts. Now, what are fronts? Now, fronts are basically the regions of separation between two, two things. Uh, so in general, uh, they, what I simulate are chemical fronts. So fronts are basically regions of separation between products and reactants in a chemical reaction. So suppose you have a petri dish. You have a petri dish of reactants. Um, let's say you have a petri dish of some kind of a acid or some kind of a base. Uh, base. And then you put in one, one sort of uh, uh, product in that uh, petri dish. So some sort of a, a reactant or a product. Then what will happen is there will be a chemical front that uh, readily propagates outward until all the fuel is kind of consumed or all there is no product in the, in this, um, uh, it, or there is no, there are no reactants in this domain. So think of it like a, like I, I use the example of a forest fire because I think this is very intuitively understandable. So suppose you have a, a dry deciduous forest in a region and you ignite one, uh, one tree somehow. Then what will happen is that ignition front, it will propagate outward until all the trees are kind of consumed and there is no fuel left in the system. So this is basically a traveling pattern that's basically developing and uh, this is called a front. Uh, the image on the top is basically a front with feedback so by feedback, I mean the front is propagating and it's also uh, exchanging or it's also modifying the flow field uh, underneath it. So suppose that forest fire front that's propagating outward, that forest fire actually locally modifies or locally creates convection cells, that kind of feeds back to the front and then there is a uh, interesting feedback mechanism. So these are all kind of, so I'm, I'm gonna show a lot of pretty pictures and simulations because I think this uh, field is uh, nice <laughs> that way. And um, and we are we're not going to do any maths at all or 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 little of it anyway. Okay, so a little bit about my career trajectory. Um, I started in JUME, 
Um, I graduated in 2015. Thereby, I went to uh, engineering. Uh, I went to study engineering mechanics in Virginia Tech under the supervision of Professor Mark Paul, and I graduated with a PhD in 2020. Uh, this is Goodwin Hall in Virginia Tech, where I spent most of my time. Then, uh, then I came here in University of Minnesota, and this is Mechanical Engineering Department again. So I'm a, I'm a postdoc here under the supervision of Jeff T. Hop. And it's very cold here, which you can see that there's always virtually snow uh, every time. So anyway, um, moving on. Pattern formation is a very widespread phenomenon. So pattern formation, self-organization, self-assembly, I'm using these terms interchangeably in a very qualitative sense, but I mean, I'm sure there are very nuances and nuanced uses of these terms, but overall what uh, what these terms mean to me is an emergence of a spatiotemporal structure when the system is driven out of equilibrium. So, uh, and this, so suppose, you know, you have spirals in your galaxy and this is observed from a space observatory. So this is the M74 uh, galaxy, which, which is forming a spiral like structure. This is the surface of the sun. And you can see the sun's surface has uh, convection cells and intricate uh, you know structures uh, in in it on it from this astronomical scale, scale, scales we go to a colony of amoeba and we see that the amoeba is driven by nutrient gradients and we see that interesting patterns are developing here as well as well as we can also see sand dunes in a desert or in a beach let's say and where you know you have uh, driving by the wind and you have local dissipation so essentially pattern formation for all the systems essentially the common link behind all the system is they are dissipative non-equilibrium systems. So let's take these terms one by one. By non-equilibrium system, we mean a system that is driven out of some kind of an equilibrium. So for convection, it is a thermodynamic equilibrium. So you are constantly feeding in energy. So the system is driven out of equilibrium, but there is dissipation. So what kind of dissipation am I talking about? Dissipation is any dissipative force, a dissipative, uh, uh, thing that dissipates energy. So suppose viscosity of the fluid or uh, you know the thermal diffusivity uh, in when talking about convection. For example, for sand dunes, the driving force is the wind and the dissipating, dissipating force is the friction between the sand, sand grains. So that's the driving and dissipation. So this tug of war, this tassel between uh, dissipation and driving, that's what uh, creates these in interesting patterns in the nature. So these, the middle images here are coat markings in animals, in mammals. And uh, these images are mainly taken from J.D. Murray's book. And I've also kind of referenced lots of popular science book uh, by, you know, Strogatz, of course, that was mentioned before, Steven Strogatz. Philip Ball has a really nice uh, tapestry on patterns. Then you can find more work on Mike Cross's uh, book website, Prigozhin, uh, J.D. Murray, of course. So coat markings in mammals can also be explained from Turing patterns, which we will come to later on in time. But essentially, uh, these are tails of different feline species. This is probably a cheetah, and this is uh, probably a jaguar or a leopard. I'm not sure of my of my you know zoology, um, but uh, essentially the coat markings in, and these a the top panel here are simulation of these patterns. So there are theories. Uh, that says that the coat markings in mammals are actually generated from some kind of a uh, pattern formation uh, from, and it can be explained from reaction diffusion systems. So, which is interesting. So any, any, the next time you see any pattern, just think of a driving force and a dissipation force that might be acting uh, against, uh, against or for uh, each other and creating, a, creating an interesting pattern. So let's go to a very well studied example called Rayleigh Bernard convection. So the first experiment was done by Henry Bernard in 1900. And the first theory of this was provided by Rayleigh. Um, what is the advantage of this uh, system, you know, studying this system? Firstly, the equations are kind of known. Uh, we know the Navier Stokes equations. If you are familiar with the fluid uh, mechanics, we know the Navier Stokes equation, and we have a fairly good understanding of the approximations we need to use to model this system. Secondly, uh, experimental accessibility. Although I'm not an experimental person myself, uh, and for me, any experiment is very difficult, but I know there are uh, experimental people here. Uh, I'm told, and I collaborate with people who, who, who of course, experiment on Rayleigh-Bernard convection, and I think it's experimentally accessible. 
and also the ease of visualization because it's a fluid system you can actually visualize these things uh, uh, visualize the patterns uh, very well so essentially what really banard convection is is basically convection you take a saucepan and you take some water and you put it on a boiler uh, you will get convection convection cells but these are those are banard cells which is i'm not going to into the details of that but essentially you have two plates fluid any kind of fluid between two plates you are heating the bottom plate up and you are keeping the top plate at a constant temperature t and the bottom plate at a, at a temperature t plus delta t now when you increase the delta t uh, after a certain critical delta t you will get convection rolls here so hot fluid will go up cold fluid will go down and these will you will get a uh, counter rotating convection rolls now for a three dimensional domain uh, if you take a mid plane slice of this and you look it from above you will actually see stripes here so this is the this is the, an example of a convective instability this is the first uh, type 1 s uh, instability which we will come to later on this is the first uh, bifurcation that happens in the system so i told you that uh, there were the, there is this equation so navier stokes equations in general are um, uh <clears throat> there is an approximation that's used here so we say that the fluid is still incompressible but the density is varying so much so that the convection is possible so by by that i mean the density is basically expanded in a taylor series in uh, temperature and then we just retain the first term of the taylor series so we say that the density is varying linearly with temperature and once you put that in the navier stokes equation you get these equations and uh, you have this uh, and th these equations are of course non dimensionalized i will come to the non dimensionalization you come to this parameter called rayleigh number which is basically the ratio of driving to dissipation so you see driving here delta t which is the your driving parameter you are hiking you are controlling the delta t more and more you are getting more and more stronger convection cells and the dissipation here is alpha which is the thermal diffusivity and nu which is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid because these dissipate energy okay so and there is frontal number which is the property of the fluid itself and i'm not going to go into too much detail of the frontal number frontal number uh, of all my simulations are about order of 1 which is for gas or uh, a gaseous mixture essentially and there are um, another important parameter so let's let's talk about the scales that we use so our length scale is d which is depth of the convection layer itself our temperature scale is delta t which is uh, the delta t is a is the temperature by which we are kind of increasing uh, uh, the um, you know the heating up the domain and the time scale is d square over alpha which is kind of the diffusion time scale uh, where alpha is a the thermal diffusivity and our aspect ratio is a very important uh, important parameter in pattern forming forming systems so aspect ratio for us is basically the ratio of the spatial is the spatial extent of the system so is the ratio of your uh, gamma x is the aspect ratio in the x direction is the ratio of lx over d and then gamma y is the aspect ratio in the y direction which is ly over d the length in the y direction over d if you consider this to be your y axis so essentially aspect ratio we need large enough aspect ratio for the system to actually see pattern formation so uh, for example a really intuitive example is that we saw coat markings in animals right so for mammals we see coat markings but for suppose for marsupials or smaller uh, mammals like rats or uh, rabbits we don't see coat markings because their aspect ratio is not large enough to see coat markings but for mammals we see that the aspect ratio has increased a little bit and we do see interesting patterns and coat markings so that's that's one intuitive way to think about aspect ratio the aspect ratio has to be large enough for us to actually see the patterns or to, to for the pattern patterns to exist so moving on so if, if i may interrupt uh, may yeah. may I ask a question should we go yeah yeah so um, if the aspect ratio for instance is not as large as you want it to be uh, is it so that uh, you i understand you say that there are no patterns that we can see but is it so is it because uh, we don't have any convection cells or is it because there are convection cells but uh, they just don't uh, form these nice looking uh, uh i don't know patterns yeah I yeah that's that's that, that's it you you don't get uh, convection rolls that form this like nice looking pattern so suppose you have an aspect but there are convection rolls there are there might be convection rolls uh, 
uh, there there will always be convection rolls i mean if if you mm-hmm. have uh, convection rolls the length scale of the convection rolls is always equal to d so the uh, the radi- uh, the diameter of the convection roll is of the order of d which is the depth of the s- cell layer so there mm-hmm. there will be some kind mm-hmm. of a roll but suppose you have your aspect ratio spatial extent is such that you just have two a pair of convection roll and you will not mm-hmm. see vivid patterns uh, out of that and they and they also uh, and the fact is if you keep increasing the delta t the two con- the mm-hmm. pair of convection rolls will remain so they they will kind of reach a steady kind of a, a state they will not uh, do interesting things uh, pattern wise uh, they'll be static in time they 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 will probably reach some kind of a static uh, uh, state in time yeah steady in time so so if i if i sum, uh, summarize so you are saying that if i take a frying pan and if i take a pot if the frying pan has a thin layer i can see things uh, which are convection rolls in nice yep. looking patterns mm-hmm. but in the big pot full of liquid the pot, uh, there yeah. are convection rolls but uh, they are not aligned in this particular orientation where i can call them as patterns but these are still no, convection rules still pat- i mean you can still call them patterns i think uh, but it's just that they are not uh, they don't have a fixed let's let me let me phrase it in such a way uh, they they don't have a, a fixed regularity uh, that we associate with uh, this uh, band of you know uh, a band of straight parallel rules or something like that so another okay. another point just because you mentioned that example when henry bernard first did this experiment in 1900s what he actually observed was bernard cells which are driven by the surface tension uh, uh, mm-hmm. of the of the fluid and not the temperature difference because before the temperature uh, convective instability happens the bernard instability happens before that so what henry B- bernard actually observed was he did not have this top plate he just had the fluid uh, which was open the surface was open so he was just uh, mm. seeing the bernard cells uh, so that's another interesting just just a side side note uh, anecdote I uh, since you were talking about uh, and i was also mentioning about boiling pots mm. and pans so oh uh, i don't know if anybody have brother has a question yeah, brother yeah, i had one question so in the uh, in the y direction it's yeah. it's closed there are two boundaries uh, yes, i mean there, there are two, two yeah there are two boundaries so the, does this thing work if you have a high enough aspect ratio but then you use something like periodic boundaries there yeah it does work okay yeah okay and generally we use uh, free uh, i mean in the side walls we use perfectly conducting side walls so the perfectly conducting think of it like it it kind of it's like a energy endless energy reservoir so if it if this uh, thing needs energy it will feed in energy from outside if it needs to dissipate heat it will dissipate heat uh, from the outside but you can actually make this periodic and you can actually study them study the system it's, it's totally up to you what you want to do okay uh, I, I, the other thing i wanted to ask is that uh, when you sh- uh, show the examples of these uh, spots on uh, the leopard yeah uh, I, i don't see how it is directly related to uh, a frying pan where there is some oil which is very thin and being heated because these mm. uh, seem to me as very different systems so what is the connecting thread which uh, mm. uh, makes them a part of the bigger so, so the connecting thread is activation and inhibition uh, so which will come to later on uh, after just after this example so so driving and dissipation right driving and dissipation these the tug of war between driving and dissipation for leads to pattern formation for skin markings in animals there are lots of i mean i think it's still an open question when people exactly don't know the driving and dissipation dissipating agents but essentially they try to explain it using turing patterns and i will come to that in turing patterns the driving and dissipation are basically two uh, chemicals with different diffusivities where uh, you have an activator and inhibitor Uh, so I'll I'll come to that and we'll see the yeah so you can you can come to that later after you're done with this uh, yeah yeah to explain yeah. that okay okay sounds good so I'll continue uh, if anyone has any questions or uh, okay so I'll I'll just continue and you can always interrupt me for questions okay so this is a simulation that I've I've done for a really banal convection and what we see here is an aspect ratio of thirty uh, so uh, in the x direction we have 30 depths so 30 
uh, times D where, you know, the D is the uh, depth of the convection layer. So I've normalized it. So D is just considered it to be one and the spatial extent is 30. And I'm using hot sidewall boundary condition here to maintain these steady patterns at a Rayleigh number of 3000. So I should say that uh, there is a critical Rayleigh number. Rayleigh number is associated with your uh, delta T, which is the thermal uh, knob that you are turning on and off. Uh, so a critical value of Rayleigh number is 1708 for, uh, for a system which has no slip uh, boundaries and infinite layer of uh, system, uh, infinite layer of a shallow layer of fluid. So if this, suppose this shallow layer of fluid is kind of infinite, and the critical Rayleigh number, I mean, the with which you can actually study the system is about, would be about 1708. So for the Rayleigh number of 3000, which is much above that 1708 criterion, you get these interesting patterns. Now, what I just want to mention here is the wave number. So you see there, there are these patterns with some sort of a regularity. So what we do in pattern formation is that we say that, so this is, this is my domain. This has an aspect ratio of gamma of 30. So I'm saying that, you know, the aspect ratio or gamma, let's do, okay. So gamma X of, let's say 30. Then I say that, you know, we have about, what we do is we basically count the convection, uh, convection rules. So here the blue is cold descending fluid and red is hot uh, uh, upward, uh, upwardly mobile fluid, which is just going up. So basically just counting the patterns. You can just count the blue uh, colors here and you will actually come to, come, come to the conclusion that there are 15 of these blue mats. So, our, so the uh, frequency or the kind of uh, length of each of these blue bands is about, I would say, so the length of each of these blue bands, I'm calling it lambda, is about gamma, which is the aspect ratio, over 15. So it's about two. And I'm not exactly using equal signs here because this is not exactly equal because there are geometric defects and other de defects. So the wavelength or length of each of these patterns is about two. Now, so this is, this you can call this as a wavelength. Now what we do is we define something as the wave number where K is the wave number. It's basically two pi over lambda. And this basically for this system will be pi and this is called wave number. So think of this as analogous to something maybe you are familiar with in time. Suppose you have a pendulum. Right, so the pendulum, for a pendulum, you have a time period T and you have a frequency omega, which is two pi over T. So these are analogous things, but this is in space and this is in time. So think of it like that. So wave, wave number is nothing but the frequency of these patterns in, in, this, in your spatial domain. So, and it's, it's an important parameter in pattern formation because it helps us to quantify uh, the number of patterns that we will get. Actually, you know, two pi, you can actually see that, you know, uh, K times lambda uh, over pi, it will get the uh, wavelength, which is the length of each of these uh, patterns. So this is kind of very heuristic and very, uh, very qualitative and it's not exactly mathematically rigorous, but just to, for you to get the idea. Uh, uh, Shoikot, uh, yeah. can can you show me in the previous slide what you would call the wavelength? Because in the previous slide you had a schematic of convection rules one after the other. Yes. Uh, yes, this one. What would be the uh, so here, for instance, uh, are you saying the distance center to center distance between the two convection no, rules is no. the wavelength? No, 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 no. What is the wavelength? So wavelength is uh, centered, not the center to center distance, but suppose uh, it it is a pair of roll. So it's a repeating structure, right? So one, so these are counter rotating convection rolls. This roll, this rotates in a different direction and this rotates in a different direction. So I cannot say that the length between these two centers is my uh, length scale or is my wavelength. I have to say that these, both these structures uh, together 
is basically is my repeating unit that's my wavelength so center to center distance between the rolls which are rotating the same direction yes yes i see yeah and because lx is much much longer than d so it is not uh, a priori intuitive that it will be uh, the lambda will be equal to 2d because lambda can be anything yeah lambda can because be I would, yeah lambda can be anything depending on so i'll come to that but the first instability that happens is generally near lambda equal to 2d about because from this schematic it seems that the uh, one cell is the size of d yes yes about order so of then it, it will always order happen of because, d. yeah because the geometry because of the geometry a convection cell's diameter will always be equal to the depth of the convection cell so if it is every alternative one then the center to center distance i was assuming yes, that yes, it would be 2 yeah you are you are correct that's okay. the first convective okay. instability that's uh, where it's about about the same it's not exactly the same because of the geometric imperfections but you are correct that's the first instability okay i understand yep so, so also one one more question on this regard is yeah. that uh, uh, one thing that uh, is i just i am having a hard time to visualize is that suppose like shorab mentioned i i can see that it it can be to start with is 2d or whatever be the size yeah but then there needs to be an integer number of these kind of things in in your domain in l as well and if l and d are some other ratio which is some number mm -hmm. then there needs to be some changes in the length in between i mean they cannot be yes, all, yes, all yes. of the same they will they will definitely that's a very good point and i'm glad you brought that point so it can be like for example 30.5 what do you do then right yeah. so what happens is that convection rolls rolls themselves kind of adjust so one convection roll becomes a little fatter one becomes a little smaller that's how they adjust okay basically so for 30 point, for a aspect ratio 30.5 you may have uh, 15 pair of convection rolls you may have 16 as well sometimes depending on your uh, depending on the state actually state of the system so it can actually go either either or uh, depending on the on your on how you are hiking it and where uh, of your control parameter yeah okay so uh, so that's that's the wave number and uh, basically it's it's not a vector actually it's called a director because it kind of points to both directions and this is called the wave uh, vector or director okay so let me let me uh, go straight to busa balloon now for uh, someone called named frederick busa he did a lot of uh, theory on this and basically he what he did was he plotted for a convection systems ignore all the maths in the left hand side i will come to that later on just focus on this image right here so what he did was for uh, for a convective system he plotted on the x-axis a bunch of wave numbers and on the y-axis a bunch of uh, Rayleigh numbers. So at a critical Rayleigh number RC, you have the first convective instability. So below this critical Rayleigh number, below this actually this dashed line, you have a conduction profile. So your fluid velocity is zero and all you get from the equations that I, the complicated equations that I sh shown was, is basically a Laplacian of, uh, temperature is equal to zero and you get a linear temperature profile. So it's just diffusion is happening below this. And above this, you get convection, convection cells, convection rolls and convection rolls. They come in all sorts of all, uh, uh, in, they can have all sorts of hue. They can have all sorts of wavelengths and wave numbers, depending on where, where you are in this, uh, where you are uh, in, with, in the Y axis, right? So for example, for uh, suppose somewhere here, you can get, can be can have a stable roll configuration and the stable roll configuration will that stable roll configuration will remain stable for a long time or you might be in an unstable roll configuration somehow and that will the system will revert back to the stable roll configuration so this is a bunch of uh, you know the busa balloon is still being constructed and there are lots of uh, but frederick busa did a lot of this linear stability analysis and also nonlinear analysis and he found that you know you can actually lot the you can actually get a sense of idea suppose you get a pattern and you see the wave number and you are curious about what the um, Rayleigh number is for that or the, what the control parameter is you can actually get a sense of that idea from the busa balloon or you are curious whether that pattern will remain steady for long times then you can see if the wave number uh, is in a stable role configuration or an unstable role configuration 
uh, like like we mentioned in the uh, in the discussion above that you know the 30.5 can have 16 roles role pairs or 15 role pairs you don't know which one is true but uh, for for a long time if something is steady you can uh, you can actually you know plot it in this uh, diagram and you can get a sense of the idea so just let me let me just do a very simple basic fundamental uh, mathematics just to show you how people derive uh, these kind of plots so uh, we we show, we saw that we had a very complicated set of fluid equations uh, which is the navier stokes equation here uh, what people do is basically they just take so let me erase my board Shoykot, I would say that if you're writing on the board, then uh, stop sharing the screen, then we can see you better. Okay. Otherwise, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. are too small, we cannot see you. Great, great, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the pointing that out. Okay. So you can see see the board now? Uh, yes, uh, uh, almost. Okay. Let me... Now it's much better. Okay, great. So suppose you have... Um, in this case of fluid velocity, but it can be any anything, uh, u is a vector. And this, basically the time evolution of this quantity is uh, uh, basically governed by this nonlinear operator n. And I'm not specifying what, what n is. n might be Navier-Stokes equation, n might be anything in this world, which any partial differential equ equation in this world, but n is uh, nonlinear and it's an operator. So what we do in pattern formation is basically we establish a base state where let's say a base state is uniform and we know that UB. And we, we say that you know this for this base state, the derivative of the base state is zero or we know that N UB is zero. So then what we do is we say that uh, we have a small, we do a small perturbation from the base state so u minus ub, and this is a very small perturbation, or by perturbation, I mean very small change in the system itself. So what happens is that, you know, for the, this perturbation to evolve, you can actually write down the equation for this perturbation And essentially, it will come out, come out to be n u b uh, because n uh, the nonlinear operator will act on this, and it will be zero or some kind of constant. And then this u you can write it as u b plus u p. So then, what we do is we basically linearize it because u p is very small. So we say that all the nonlinearities in the system we can linearize them. And we can write it as, let's say, some kind of a operator n hat uh, times up. And this is now a linear equation. The reason I'm saying it's a linear equation is because you have up here and n up. And for linear equation, what's the definition of a linear equation? So if you do f of a plus b, it will just be a plus b, right? So you can do, you can add terms to both sides and it will be this, you could be essentially translationally invariant. Okay, so we, we get this equation here and then what people in pattern formation do, they basically uh, use a, a mode. So let me erase this here. So they essentially use a mode. Um, they say that if UP is a function of my space and my time, they said that if this is equal to some kind of an amplitude a e to the power of sigma t and e to the power of i uh, q, which is my wave vector dot x. So by doing this, this is basically Fourier modes. So essentially what they say is that this perturbation is growing in time with the growth rate sigma. And it's also in space, it has a wave number q. So this perturbation has uh, some kind of a, um, some kind of a repetition in the space and the repetition is captured by Q. And then it also has an amplitude um, A, right? So now if you put this 
uh, we got uh, yes. can i interrupt you sure. yeah uh, uh, can could you please give a hint on the background principle for the undergrad students here like how you come up to the four year modes it could be more understandable to them like just give the principle just talk about the principle like how you come to this four year modes or something maybe okay uh, so what i can say is that you know whenever you have repetitions or whenever you have some kind of repetitions in a system let's say for a pendulum uh, you have some kind of a repetition in time uh, for pattern forming systems you have some repetitions in space think of sines and cosines that's all you need to do so think of sines and cosines you know sines and cosines repeat you have a sin x curve that repeats and you have a cosine x curve that repeats now exponentials are nothing but sines and cosines they are summations of sines and cosines so that's why we use exponentials uh, and fourier modes are basically uh, i mean you don't even need to uh, call them fourier modes in space you can call this this to be a summation of sines and cosines i'm just saying that you know i'm capturing this repetition using some sines and cosines and i'm using this uh, mode here or this exponent exponent here um, e to the power i q x which is basically just sin q x plus i or cos q x plus i sin q x and then also in in um, you know in in time also we we are saying we are assuming that there is some kind of a growth this is an assumption that there is a, some kind of a growth e to the power of sigma t and sigma can be real it can be imaginary it can be anything in this world uh, we don't know so th this is at the end of the day, this is this is an assumption but mostly in partial differential equations we use this uh, kind of a technique to a separate the variables and two because exponentials are really easy to deal with and whenever you have and you can actually pretty much come up with uh, explain any uh, any system with exponent exponentials so that that would be my kind of explanation but chandana do you have anything to add to that or no 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 i just wanted for the undergrads to just have some elaboration on that thank you yeah go ahead okay thank you no problem so so uh, correct me if i'm wrong so uh, because uh, then it will help me understand better so uh, in the beginning when you did the linearization uh, so is it something like you take up because you brought the example of a pendulum yes and we know the equation of a pendulum is uh, uh mx double dot equal to sin x k sin x or g yeah. sin x something yeah. like that yeah and then you said that well this x has a solution and uh, but i want to linearize it that means it has a small uh added uh thing which is like it's sign yeah and so this sin x becomes small so it becomes theta so you yeah. now are saying yeah, or x, x becomes theta. Becomes, exactly yeah it's the yes same. so you're saying so you're saying mx so is that what you said so that's the first step that you did and step. now you're saying so that I just, to, Shura, I just want yes. to interrupt with one thing. It's it's not sine x becomes x because it should be sine of x naught plus some small perturbation. So yes. you have yes. a state already, right? So it's yes. not it won't be just x in this case. Yes. Open so it's sine of x naught plus sine x theta naught plus, plus small small yeah. perturbations. Yeah. Small perturbation. That small perturbation. Let's call it x. So then it becomes just that. So if you expand which is, that, it becomes that cosine x naught times small perturbation. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And now we are saying that this x is uh, it is a function of time and space. So okay, now we cannot use x. Let's call it theta. So it's a function of x and t, but we don't know it might grow or it might decay. Yeah. So we are saying it it, it it is so it is eta is it is e to the power I don't know lambda t. And sigma if lambda t, is positive, then it yeah. sigma t. So sigma yeah. t. So if it is positive, it grows. If it's negative, it, it probably decays. Exactly. And uh, then similarly, you have a component which is in space, which can grow or decay. Okay, I see. Yeah. Is, and, is or, that... or, and it can repeat. Yeah, that's that's essentially the idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. So then, what we do is we uh, basically and uh, once you put this solution to this equation here. and of course i'm not solving any system but you end up with a with your growth rate sigma being a function of your wave number q some sort of some sort of a relation between your growth rate and your wave uh, number q so that that is the essential relation that basically helps us to quantify the patterns so the sigma can be real complex the q can be real or 
it can it can it, the queue is imaginary in most cases because uh, oh i'm sorry the queue is real but uh, the sigma is real in most cases the sigma the growth rate because it always grows and it when sigma becomes imaginary there is there are traveling oscillations so we'll come to that later on okay so uh, anyway so th this relation helps us to quantify the pattern so let me go back to my slides and so, so this the, a is the amplitude of the uh, this a is the amplitude of the disturbance or the um, uh, like in the case of the pendulum so mm -hmm. is it the amplitude of the pendulum or is it like the amplitude of the disturbance that i if i if i just hit it like this then is it th that amplitude yeah yeah it's it's the amplitude uh, amplitude of the you can you can think of it like an amplitude of the pendulum is it the, because i thought probably it's the amplitude of the disturbance uh, so, so i'm saying that there is a pendulum oh, going no, no, no. this it's not the amplitude of the pendulum it's so is it the amplitude yeah, of the disturbance it's the amplitude of the disturbance. yeah that's what i meant yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay so amplitude of disturbance yeah Okay. Shweta, I have a question. Yes, sure. Uh, so, so when you, I think the method that you are following uh, uh, showed over here is the one that was explained on Strogatz, right? In terms of the resolution. I remember Strogatz, studying it. Like, in yes. Strogatz, there, it deals with ODEs. So there is no space here. There is no space right. in Strogatz. So okay. think, of, think of this term to be not there. So I think other than that, if you just have a ODE and if you just substitute A times E to the power of sigma T, you will get um, all kinds of nice uh, quadratic equations and or cubic equations, and then you can solve them. Okay, so uh, I have not worked in this area for the last few years, but uh, here the perturbation term is uh, sort of periodic in nature, right? The way you have assumed it. Yes, yes, is, yeah, that's the, is, that's the is, essence is, of it. Yeah, it, it is, has is, is that the basic requirement for any kind of pattern formation study? Because the way I understand patterns, it can also be the patterns in the basic field, which in this case mm -hmm. is the U, and the perturbation itself can be just any random term. Uh, am I thinking bogus or is there something? No, so, so I think what you're saying is that Q can be anything, right? So Q, it doesn't necessarily have to be a repeating pattern. It can be a pattern which is not repeating in that sense is that yeah, yeah that right yeah, question yeah. so think of q as a summation of frequencies right so you you can have a suppose you have you have a uh, vortex sheet right and you have vortices all all sorts of vortices small big and you have all kinds of distribution but at the end of the day it's a sum of a lot of uh, sum of a sum of a lot of exponents or sum of a lot of sines and cosines right so, and you can actually draw, draw a food in the Fourier space, you can find a frequency of that distribution as well. So think of it like that. Now, if that distribution, if that in that Fourier space, if that distribution is period is, has a, some kind of a repeating nature to it, then you will just have one or two wave numbers. If not, then you will have a lot of wave numbers for, for your perturbations. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so my okay. essential aim for this was I'm sorry, I just muted. No, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. But my essential aim for this was just to show you this uh, Busa balloon again. And you know, now you can think of this Rayleigh number as some kind of a growth rate sigma. And you, 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 have, you have your wave number. So then you have this kind of a function that, uh, that, that is there in the plot. And now you can actually play around with this. By playing around, I mean you can for for a system you can get a certain Rayleigh number and a wave number, and you can you know have some qualitative sense of the pattern uh, how it is. So if you have a Rayleigh number, you can get a idea. So for a Rayleigh number like this, the pattern can actually exhibit any patterns from here to here, right? And but it it should remain in this band. So that's essentially the work. Now I will just point out that a large volume of work is in Chandra Sekhar uh, book uh, Hydromagnetic and Hydrodynamic Instabilities. And it's a really nice book. It's a very dense book, but you know, a large volume of this work has been done, linear stability analysis has been done by Chandra Sekhar. Okay. So, so, so I have a question regarding this. Uh, so help me understand this uh, booster balloon. So, mm -hmm. um, Tell me where I'm wrong. So um, if I think of it like this, so R is a driving is the driving force essentially. Yes. 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 So if I for a fixed R. Yeah. So when I have a small Q, I'm essentially saying that uh, the wave is like this, which is like, and for large Q, it is like this. 
like a lot of things are cramped in. Is, is, that, of, is that what? A lot of things. Uh, yeah. So more the wave number. So if it. Yeah. So that means at low wave numbers, when it is like this, mm -hmm. so uh, it's you're saying it's not stable. So if I go back to the original problem, when I had a thin layer of oil on a frying pan, yeah. uh, so the, I'm trying to say that if you consider a convection, uh, a series of convection rolls where uh, the size is much, much larger than D, then it is not stable. Uh, but if, uh, which, which is essentially saying this small Q, but if it is a large, much, much large Q, when there's no, no, like this is, lot of- is things. not associated like that. So suppose you have a small shallow or a small box where you just get a couple of convection mm -hmm. rolls, right? Okay. You get a couple of convection rolls. Just you, you have a couple of convection rolls in your, uh, in your hand. What is the Q then? Okay. The Q is same as you have for a uh, for an aspect ratio 30, and if you have 30 convection rolls there, the Q is same for both these systems. So I'm saying for a fixed aspect ratio, yeah. if I imagine uh, a case, which is probably not possible, but if I forcefully make a lot of uh, uh, rolls inside by changing uh, the size of the rolls themselves, mm -hmm. uh, well, for instance, I'm saying it's not a cylinder. It is. It now looks like a disc, which is not yeah. reality because you don't have disc-looking rolls. So a disc-looking okay. roll would imply a small Q for a fixed R, and that is unstable because that's we don't see that. And if you go to the other end of the spectrum where you have very large Q, you're saying that now it is uh, not a flat disc. It's like an oblong disc like this, and that is also not stable. It yes. is somewhere yes. in the middle where you have somewhere the stability in the zone. You have this where Roll configuration, stable con convection. Yeah. So, which means that there's a sweet spot in how many waves you can have for a fixed yeah. convection. Yeah. yeah, and you can actually okay. for I, for a yeah, and for a certain Rayleigh number, you can actually be in the instability region as well. I mean, you never know. Uh, but once you are in the instability, that's why we need to run these simulations for a long time just to just to get rid of a initial transients and see that you know we are in the stable roll configuration as well. Okay, and what other other thing I noticed that as you increase the forcing, then the this the sweet spot of Q yeah, increases. Spot of it increases, yeah. Because increases, as you are if you decrease the forcing, yeah, this is a very interesting point, and thank you for bringing it up. As you are increasing forcing, you get a lot of wave numbers, so the patterns can exhibit hmm. a lot of. Uh, I mean, the patterns can have actually multiple wave numbers as well. So this comes back to the problem, uh, to the you know the problem that Basuda was also talking about. The sheet of vort vortices, it, it can have a range of wave numbers, right? So the, as, as you increase R, you get patterns which may have, may have multiple wave numbers. It's not a sing singular wave number anymore. I see. Yeah. But when I decrease, so decreasing R is like uh, decreasing the temperature of the frying pan, which is a thin layer of oil. Yes. And so there comes a temperature uh, where you can barely have convection rules and that is only yes. of one kind of a fixed wave number of a fixed wave and uh, yeah below, actually, if i decrease the temperature that it's yeah, gone actually actually if you increase. see the nature of this uh, uh, curve this is actually uh, mm. something like a r to the power of four i mean uh, fourth order and this is actually second order so in reality it's very difficult to get one fixed wave number I mean, you see uh, what I'm saying for experimentally for RC, you will always have two, you will always cross this. I mean, you'll always have a line that intersects this curve in two points in reality. So it's it's a very difficult mm. problem, but I yeah, in theory, yes, you will get one wave number. Okay. Uh, well, if you have a system size that only allows one roll, then probably you will have just one. Yeah. One... Like in the case of a very small drop as we were, uh, which was rolling mm -hmm. as we had spoken. But anyway, I understand this uh, much better now, so you can move on. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, yeah, great. Thanks for bringing these questions. These are also helping me uh, uh, to explain this system. Okay, so let me let me come back or go to a different kind of a system, which is fronts or and waves. So let me go back to this, or uh, let me uh, show you this partial differential equation here. This is suppose a concentration C of anything of your chemical. And so the basically the temporal derivative, the, uh, the time evolution of this concentration is uh, governed by this uh, Laplacian term. Laplacian is nothing but the second derivative in space. Uh, and this Le here, Le is the Lewis number or think of it as a diffusion coefficient. I will uh, talk about Lewis number later on, but this comes up in uh, the way I non-dimensionalize the problem. And Xi is basically your reaction rate. 
So this term here, C times one minus C, what is this? This is basically a chemical production term. So essentially, your uh, uh, the state of C equal to one is represents products, chemical products, and the state of C equal to zero is basically unstable reactants. Uh, now, why I say unstable and stable, C equal to one, why do I say that C equal to one is stable and why do I say the C equal to zero is unstable? Now you have FC of C times one minus C. If you take a, you know, so let me, let me stop share, stopping the sharing and just to show you. Okay. So suppose you have your function FC, C times one minus C, I'm saying that C is a concentration of any chemical and it's normalized such that C of one is products and C of zero are reactants. So anything between C equal to one to C equal to zero are basically your chemical species. So I mean, that's basically what consists of the front. Um, so essentially this is C minus C squared. Now, if you take a derivative of this, if that's C, it becomes one minus two C with respect to C. If you, uh, I mean, if you take a derivative with respect to C. Now, basically you can see that F dashed zero is one and F dashed of one, if you put C of one here, it becomes minus one. What does this mean? This means that any perturbation that grows from the state of C equal to zero, the derivative df dc is positive. So the perturbations will grow, <clears throat> will grow. And any perturbation that starts from the state of C equal to one, the perturbations will decay because the derivative of that, of that uh, the derivative of the state with respect to C is less than one. So that's all that I mean by stable and unstable, but you can also intuitively think about that. So a chemical system, will always go towards the state of stability or it will always let the reaction happen rather than stopping the reaction. So the reaction will always happen and the products will always form. So the products are stable and reactants, uh, quote unquote reactants are unstable. Uh, okay, let me share my screen again. So C is the concentration of the re uh, products or the reactants? Of the normalized products. Products. Yes. So one minus C is, is it the concentration of the reactants? Yes, absolutely. That's it. So this is, this is a, okay. uh, this is in terms of chemical uh, systems. This is like a reaction mm -hmm. in terms like A plus B to C kind of a reaction. So in fact, there are not, there are no two species. So it, you can say that A, A plus B to two B, something of this sort of a reaction. Uh, which so I think, I think what is happening if there are, if there is a product is say B and reactants are A, then A plus B is one essentially. And then you have a fraction. C is essentially a fraction, just tells you what is the fraction of the total amount, which is products and the rest is then reactants, right? Yeah, yeah, it is normalized. So yeah. uh, C is essentially normalized. So you have basically the C is, yeah, like, like you said, the fraction of the product. Mm -hmm. So everything is non-dimensionalized non and normalized. So I, I think that this is more intuitive. That's why I kept it like this, but you know, so essentially if you simulate this equation and I'll come to the simulation, you get a wave, a chemical wave. So we are plotting concentration as a function of X here. And we are seeing that a wave that develops that travels from left to right until and unless all the state, so state at C, here the state is c equal to zero. You see the c equal to zero here. You see c equal to one here. So the wave kind of propagates until everything here is invaded and becomes c equal to one. So this, this uh, kind of system is called FKPP uh, after Fisher 1937 and Kolmogorov, Petrovsky and Pishkinov in 1937, they basically first uh, invent or model this uh, system uh, in the, they were actually modeling the spread of advantageous genes in a population. And they called it, I mean, we call it now FKPP reaction. It's just fischer kolmogorov petrovsky uh, hefty name, but just for C times one minus C. 
Now, this basically this nonlinearity, this mo this model is used in a lot of other areas like population dynamics, chemical reactions, epidemiology, etc. And also another point of point is that this is also a traveling pattern. So you have a traveling structure that's actually kind of persisting. So the traveling structure maintains its shape by because because there is a reactant and there is product and there is endless supply or at least till the reaction is finished there is endless supply of e either reactants and products so that's what actually maintains the self organized structure this is a simulation so this is this was playing in time the previous one so at any point yes, of time yes, you were yes. saying that yeah. uh, that's what some I of said. it is one and some okay yeah, that's what i said uh, so no. it propagates from left to right the time is actually it's advancing in time. This wave is advancing in time. So you have C equal to zero, state of C equal to zero here, mm -hmm. and the state of C equal to one here. So the wave propagates in time such that everything here at C equal to zero becomes C equal to one. Okay, but then for a given X, uh, yeah, uh, I, it's not entirely, uh, immediately obvious to me how C changes in time. Is, is there something that you're going to tell next? Uh, I don't know. For, for a given x, if you, let's say, you, you fix the value of x of 5, right? Yeah. So the c of at x of 5 will basically go from 0 to 1. It's a monotonous increase in c. It will go from 0 to 1 with a sharp increase, uh, like the kind of increase that, that OK. No, this, this increase okay. here, yeah, exactly. So this increase here, hmm. this is just the shape of the front in, in space. So this is, we are plotting the concentration as a function of X. Okay, I see. So this is actually one dimensional. So let's let's just say that the Laplacian is del two C del X two in just one dimension. Mm -hmm. So you have this structure that's propagates. And if you do it in two dimensions, then you can get a structure like this, where you know red is, let's say products and blue is, let's say a solution of reactants. And you get a front that's propagating such that it invades the uh, reactants. And you know, this stuff you see in green here, that's basically the front that's basically separating mm -hmm. the reactants and the products. What's the boundary condition in this, this case? With in, in space? this case, I have used no flux boundary conditions okay. for simulations in the in actually in all the material surfaces. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's let's focus on this system more. And uh, basically, a bunch of this work you can find in Wim Van Sarlu's work, John Tyson from Virginia Tech, Mike Cross. And you have this reaction diffusion systems. Uh, Le and Xi again are just parameters. Forget about them. Xi is the reaction rate. How strong your reaction is is just a number. And Le is the diffusion coefficient. So think of it like that. Now this equation actually admits a traveling wave solution. Because you see, saw that there was a traveling wave. So there was a wave-like structure that's propagating. So it admits a traveling wave solution. And speed of that wave is about uh, this quantity here. Um, and the, it becomes this quantity for a minimum, um, for the linear, uh, if we do the linear stability analysis again. The, the speed we get for the linear uh, perturbations is basically, basically this linear spreading speed here. Uh, if we do the perturbations, and it's also there, are, the, it can be classified as pulled and pushed uh, with the initial condition. So this problem is very dependent on the initial conditions. Surprisingly enough, this uh, simple, I mean, a seemingly simple partial differential equation does not have an exact solution. It has a parameter family of exact solution, uh, where c x y, let's say c, uh, you know, in x, let's let's just consider one dimension it will become uh, this quantity here where xt is the traveling coordinate and uh, you will basically traveling coordinate is x minus vft by the way and you will essentially have this rp which can be varying depending on the initial conditions and depending on the system so we classify fronts as pulled or pushed depending on the initial condition like i said this is a very dependent on initial conditions so es essentially Pulled means it's linearized. So the linear perturbations actually uh, govern the system, whereas pushed means that the nonlinearities in the system are actually governing the system. So 
let's let's just concentrate on the fkpp equation and i'm sure this is a very easy uh, mathematics calculus here i'm sure everyone can do it but this is just a partial differential equation we are saying that there is a there is a traveling wave that exists so we can say that cx of x and t can can be represented as x minus vt so uh, this is a s where s is a traveling coordinate x minus vt v is the speed at which the uh, wave is traveling so if you substitute th that in this equation you get a od ordinary differential equation and then if you linearize it uh, again because we we are uh, we want to be at small q values then you essentially end up with this equation here then because this is only in space here it, there is only one quantity here s we use a solution like a in times e to the power of lambda s and we solve it and we essentially uh, get that kind of velocity and uh, uh, and the you know the initial conditions so let me just solve this equation instead and i will show you a simulation where i have basically i can show you the initial conditions and uh, where we can get more intuition of this problem okay so let's say you have an equation partial differential equation so in when we deal with partial differential equation we always deal we always think how to you know reduce them to ods to understand them better so this is always a motivation that works so we say that c is a function and this is just in one dimension in space as a function of x and t i'm going to write it as x minus vt or i'm going to write it as cs and then what will happen blah 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 the equations i'm not uh, going into the too too much details but essentially you will end up with an ode where d is now ordinary differential equation in s so this is just an ordinary differential equation the way you solve it is again you say that you know c let c be and you linearize it as well so c times 1 minus c i'm just saying let's just keep the linear term here let's just say c epsilon c and you say c is a times e to the power of lambda s then what will happen is you will get a quadratic equation in lambda right so you will have le lambda square plus v lambda plus xi lambda equal to 0 this will be your quadratic equation the solution to this equation is very simple and as as you know uh, the solution to any quadratic equation we can write it as lambda equal to minus v plus minus root over of v square minus 4 le times i over 2 le so what can we say about the system we can say that lambda or you know the growth of uh, in in space because this is a real thing so the lambda is at least real for this perturbation so for the lambda to be real we must have this determinant which is positive so the v square has to at least be equal to or larger than 4 le xi and that's how you actually arrive at the minimum speed condition so the minimum spreading speed is basically 2 times root over of le xi that's what kolmogorov arrived in 1937 in this in his paper the linear spreading speed of uh, this system now you can actually substitute this if if i say that this term is zero so the basically the growth of this in space or the let's say the wave uh, some something analogous to wave number is the lambda it basically becomes minus v by 2 le i'm saying this term is zero so then it uh, if you substitute this minimum criterion here is this will become minus root over of xi over le so the initial profile the initial concentration profile has to be at least this much steep to have uh, this uh, velocity here 
So I, I mean by what I mean by steep and non-steep. So if you have a function, let's say concentration as a function of X, now it can be, uh, it can be very steep. By steep, I mean the gradient is, so, so in, in, it's basically, uh, or it can be very flat. By steep, I mean the gradient here is essentially infinite. And here is basically, it's very flat. So, so this value here, this gives you a steepness criteria for the initial condition for the, with which the reaction propagates. So the initial condition for the reaction has to be this steep for the, for the velocity to be V min minimum. And this is called pulled front. A front that obeys this principle is called a pulled front as if it's pulled, quote unquote, pulled by the linear uh, profile or the, by the linear solution. Contrary to this is pushed front when, when your, this uh, initial disturbance or initial profile is flatter, is a flat profile. Then what happens is that the, the velocity that uh, we get is actually cannot be described by this linear analysis. The velocity is larger than this linear analysis. And the velocity we get is basically what is called pull, push front. So I'll just, just show a quick simulation here. And then so Ellie, Ellie, Ellie here, uh, Ellie here is uh, like diffusivity. Is it? Yeah, that? Ellie is just a diffusion coefficient. That's it. So so. Okay. Yeah. And Zai okay. is some kind of a reaction rate, some kind of a time scale for the reaction. Zai is a time scale for the reaction, or is it length scale? No, it's a time scale. It's a time scale. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me show you the equation and say that why it is the time scale. It's one over time, right? Yes, yes, one over time, exactly. So okay, yeah. I mean, I mean, you can you can uh, have that intuition, right? So if dc dt is equal to something like you know del square c plus xi times some function of c, then xi has units one over time. So it's a, it's a some sort of a time scale. So you can actually you know so this has units of um, S L squared over T and this has units of one mm. over T. So overall you get mm. velocity units L over T if you do the non-dimensionalization. So. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah. okay. Do the scale. Okay, so let me just run this simulation real quick. Uh, just a small script in MATLAB or stop here. Okay, so I have uh, I have a I have fixed the Lewis number or the diffusion coefficient to a value, and the xi to have a value of nine. And these are just known values. I will come to what these actually mean later on, but trust me, trust me, these are good values. And you get a velocity value of about 0.6. I mean, minimum v min of 0.6, and your lambda min, which is the basically the square root of xi over L, that becomes about 30. So I am so for my I'm just using an Euler time step, right? So I'm you I'm saying my con concentration initially has a steepness of minus lambda times x, and I am basically just evolving this system in time, um, and we see what happens. So can you see the movie here? The concentration is yeah. as a function of time, and as time uh, you know goes. Uh, as time increases, the concentration basically the wave travels from left to right, essentially. And you know, I can share this code, and you can play around with the initial conditions and the velocities. Um, uh, and then, you know, build some more intuition if you want. Should have selected a lesser size of the X direction to get smaller time for computation. I just wrote this code yesterday. So forgive me for the time that it takes for the simulation. Okay, so the point is that you get a velocity 
and uh, let's let's do the so this is basically the velocity v in the y axis velocity as a function of time and time is just uh, you know just these these units are basically time in some sense so your velocity goes to about a value of 0.6 which is our i mean it asymptotically arrives at that velocity which is also very interesting but uh, the blue line here is basically tracking the front so i'm just uh, i'm saying that my i'm just keeping a uh, uh, i'm taking care of the x coordinate of this and i'm just tracking it so the blue line is that it doesn't do a it's a it's a second order base method and doesn't do a pretty i mean does a fairly good job in in a in an average sense but this red line is a more sophisticated method called bulk burning burning rate i'm not going to do too much detail of this but this is integral of depth integral of the concentration and it gives you a nice value of the velocity but compare this with uh, let's say a flatter profile of the trajectories so let's do let's add uh, 20 so essentially you will start with a flatter profile and i will show uh, let's see so let's do lambda 10 okay so you see this profile that we are starting with it's much flatter and what will eventually happen is because you see this is in the movie as well this is way faster than what we saw in the last movie so the wave is now much faster because of the initial conditions and it travels much faster it has it will eventually reach the side wall the previous simulation didn't didn't even reach the side wall so it will reach the side wall faster and the velocity here will be larger than what we have and this is an example of a pushed front which is basically pushed uh, because of the non linearities behind it as if uh, and it cannot be explained by the linearized uh, set of equations okay so i'm not going to uh, let this movie finish i will just show you a plot of the velocity I'm calling it, calling it VF. Okay, so you see that the velocity in time is actually about it's close to one. So it's larger than the V min velocity. Anyway, so I can share this script with you guys if you are interested, and you can play around with the initial conditions and the you know the velocities. Okay, so this pretty much wraps up my fundamental or basic kind of thing. Oh, I think I just had one more thing about Turing. I'm not. going to too much details on this but this actually relates to the animal coat uh, skin patterns that we see so alan turing who is famously i think if you guys have seen imitation game he's famously known for cracking the nazi code during world war 2 um he was a british scientist uh, and uh, he 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 died pretty young and he he had a very tragic life i just want to reflect on his life because he was a homosexual man and he suffered persecution because of his sexuality in uh, in the conservative britain and he was not he was actually jailed he was incarcerated and um, eventually what happened was um, he tried to do some you know sex change operation which also probably didn't work out and he suffered from depression and all that sort of thing but he made a lot of important contribution to sciences and especially in pattern formation what he realized in this paper the chemical basis of morphogenesis and i thoroughly encourage you to read this paper this is not a dense paper it's a beautifully written paper he he said that if you have two chemicals let's say u1 and u2 and you have this reaction reacting diffusing chemicals and you suppose um u1 is uh, you know diffusing diffusion coefficient d1 u2 is diffusing diffusion coefficient d2 and you have production term f1 and f2 you have basically this equation is just written in vector form and what he realized was from linear stability analysis i'm not going to do the linear stability analysis is that if you have if you consider one to be activator and one of the chemicals to be inhibitors by activator i mean that the df by du or what we were doing initially like for F fc i i showed you the production uh, the derivative of the production term was positive or negative so positive de derivative of the production term means that that it's grows in time and negative derivative of the production term with respect to that means it decays in time so activator and inhibitor 
So if you have this, you can, from the linear stability analysis, you can arrive at this conclusion that there will be patterns in this system if L2 is greater than L1. And what is L? L is basically a diffusion length. L is basically D divided by this coefficient A, where A is just the derivative of this production terms. With respect to you. So it's called, it's in general, it's called local activation, long range inhibition. Think of it like this, that, that you have a long range suppression of, uh, of patterns. Um, and you have local, very local uh, activations. So th that can create um, interesting uh, pattern formation in reaction diffusing systems. And this is solely driven by the diffusion coefficients. So generally we see, we tend to tend to see that diffusion, like Brotoda said the other day, fixed law, it kind of smooths things out. But here actually diffuse, diffusion, or let's say the relative uh, interplay of diffuse, diffuse, diffusion coefficients actually kind of induces an instability in these systems. And you get this uh, kind of interesting pattern formation. And I will just show a chemical, an example of this is basically you can actually see the figure A is belusov zabotinsky reaction, which is a very well-known reaction of malonic acid and potassium bromide. Um, B and C are chloride iodide reactions. Now, I must tell you that before 1900s, uh, people didn't believe that uh, chemical reactions can have patterns or can exhibit uh, oscillations and patterns. So this belusov zabotinsky reaction, and this is from a YouTube video, um, just uh, showing you the initial, how the reaction occurs, is basically not only pattern forming, but it's oscillating in time. And chemists didn't tend to uh, believe at first that chem chemistry can you know, lead to some, because they thought that reactions are one way processes from products to reactants, and that's it. And there is no uh, interplay or no coming back. Uh, in, in, in that journey from product to reactants, there cannot be anything else. But it was shown in belusov zabotinsky reaction that you can have interesting patterns, traveling patterns and oscillations in uh, chemical systems. And this can be explained by curing patterns. So what I, what, what I want you to do is just to know this vocabulary of curing patterns and just Google them and maybe look at some more pretty pictures. And you know, if you are interested, we can also do the linear stability analysis. Broto, did you have any questions? Yeah, so, so I was uh, I was thinking I was going to suggest that uh, maybe we can um, pause for a while and take some questions from maybe the undergraduates who okay. are here. And yeah, they, are, they have some any general queries uh, and yes. open it yes. to them yes. for a while yes. Yes. before we proceed. That's all. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Uh, yeah, it has been I think more about one and a half hours. So. So yeah, maybe. Uh... So uh, I see that uh, now uh, we have uh, so Arnob uh, since uh, now we have spoken to you before, and uh, I I see Onik Chakraborty uh, who has uh, we have not been introduced to him and Shrovan also. Uh, so Arnob, do you have? I mean, feel free to ask any question whatsoever. That these are uh, they're not it easy things. Really have to and... be from the slides or anything. You just you can ask. Yeah, them. just. Yeah. So uh, I had a question uh, regarding the. When the equation came, which is function of c equal to c into one minus c. Yeah. So, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, does that hint to uh, a bit the main equation of chaos theory also? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, it's uh, basically the period doubling route to chaos. If you're familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard about it. So, the chaos yeah. theory is basically x t plus one equal to x t one minus x t. Yeah. So. yeah. So yeah. logistic you, growth. Yeah. yeah, you can actually, I was going to tell, you can basically, uh, you can introduce the logistic map equation. Or logistic map equation, center. absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can yes. basically uh, give the relation to them if possible, just relate how it is related to the logistic map. Yeah, I didn't put it in the slides, but I'll probably do it later on. Uh, sure, yeah, sure. yeah, it's, it's the logistic growth and you can actually, um, you know, go to, and it's even study period doubling route to chaos, like Ovik mentioned. And so I see that, um, you know, <laughs> the lecture has been going long and I've been trying to be careful in, you know, explaining all the, all the things. So, and the next, next step was going to be sharing my research, but I think I might not have too much time uh, 
about that or i can breeze through some simulations and pretty pictures if you guys want uh, what do you think anand what should we do i think anand has uh, run off to an errand okay uh, so we can we can we can also probably uh, interact a bit more with uh, strobon i think we have not uh, yes. uh, been introduced sure. to you strobon maybe it's rabun i don't know and dipin sir if you left <laughs> suggestions or questions please feel free to or no if you want to say something yeah, and uh, we know you so first thing about pattern formation that come um, the thing that comes to my mind is machine learning <laughs> so okay mm here uh, here the most of the equations have been linear is the is is the link yes I was, linear is i was thinking if the if we can if we can recognize the pattern and go in the reverse direction actually mm. and think about what uh, what how the, the reaction progresses yes. in more detail yeah yeah absolutely i i i missed the question if anyone can repeat for me because i uh, either oh. there was a disturbance on the internet from my end or this and so i think the question was that we are having an equation and then we solve the equation and then we see a pattern right but for example if i give you a pattern can you go in the reverse direction and say what are the terms that can give rise to the patterns and learn kind of the ods or the pds that can give rise to such kind of patterns Ooh, is that well, correct i, I see i see i see yes especially especially in, in recent recently i attended a seminar there it was machine learning was impl implemented with the uh, safety equations and yeah so there is this yeah. theme that's coming out in this uh, machine learning given research where you discover pds from data uh, yes so that that's that's probably what what it yeah. makes <clears throat> So, uh, Onik, if you are uh, Ornob, Ornob, right? Ornob, if you are interested, uh, there is this uh, thing called Cindy. Um, just, just Google yeah. uh, University of Washington Cindy, and you will probably land into the page of um, Stephen Brunton, who is actually working on uh, this uh, machine learning-driven equation generation of, of systems. thing in the second slide you showed that the role, roles uh, for uh, for aspect ratio for a fractional aspect ratio you mm -hmm. said that the roles could have uh, 15 or 16 it depends on that yeah i would is it possible for the uh, roles to shrink shrink or expand uh, throughout the length scale like uh, in the bidin that uh, the roles should be uh, uh, of yeah, less yeah, yeah. diameter yeah that's what that's what happens the roles are generally fatter in the middle and smaller in the near the edges or it can be the either way as well yeah that can happen or it can throw out one one role but the role has to be integer number of rows that's one criteria convection roles have to be integer number of rows what about for a sphere for a sphere uh, what do you mean exactly mm, the geometry used is for cube or type of Yeah. What about the really what happens, happens for us? Yeah. What happens to them? Um, I mean, firstly, I, yeah. Well, uh, in a sphere, what happens? So suppose the Earth is uh, spherical, almost spherical. So we have convection cells in our. We have convection in the atmosphere, right? So yes. what happens is that uh, the sun rays they heat up uh, the ambient surface, and the fluid or the air that goes up and Forms big convection rolls. That happens on a sphere, but the Earth has a large aspect ratio. So, so even for a sphere, let's say you know the if you do the if you somehow the thickness or you know the length scale of the atmospheric thickness, um, if you uh, if you take the radius of the Earth and if you divide the uh, atmospheric thickness, you get a extremely oh, large wow. aspect ratio. Yeah. I was cold. <laughs> yeah. So essentially. Uh, in in the limit of uh, in the limit of uh, uh, problematic uh, simplicity we do not as we do not say that it's we are solving the solution in a sphere i mean you can do it uh, many people many people actually solve 
mental convection and all sorts of uh, convection problems on spheres, actual spheres. So they do experiments and they, they do simulations. I don't do it. The necessity, the essential, uh, uh, the problem is exactly the same. There is no difference in terms of the, I mean, there is still Just an aspect ratio. There is still, uh, you will have roles which are governed by what the aspect ratio is. Just a change in coordinate system. Yeah, coordinate systems are changed, of course. Sounds very good. So uh, what I might do is just go through just some simulations. What do you think, uh, Brotoda, Nada? Is that is that a good idea? I mean, it's, uh, we should ask the, the uh, we should ask the uh, Onik and uh, or no, what they want. Join us back. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. If if Shrovan is back, sure. then Shrovan also. So oh, we have not heard from Shrovan. Shrovan, uh, can you hear us? Something, yeah. Uh, yes, sure. Of the actually, when you asked uh, just right then, the Zoom was not working properly. Uh, I, I, I had to disconnect myself. I, I'm uh, I'm a third year mechanical student of okay. Jal. Uh, hi, Shrovan. Nice to meet you. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, feel free to ask anything whatsoever. Uh, actually, uh, um, that uh, when uh, Shoikoda was explaining Turing's work, uh, I didn't uh, understand at that point of time, the words were disconnected. So can you oh, re-explain it? Yeah, sure, sure, I can do that. Uh, so all I said was Turing, Sorry. what Turing did among his yeah. many works is that he took two equations, two reaction diffusion equations. Yeah. And, and he said that, you know, U1 is basically, you know, diffusing and it's reacting with U2. Right, so the chemical production terms, this Fs here, are basically functions of U1 and U2. And what he did was he did a linear stability analysis with the same kind of idea that I showed, but I'm not showing the maths here, okay? But what he found was you can, from this two system, two, two set of uh, reaction diffusion systems, you can get pattern formation, provided there is a condition. What is that condition? The condition is L2 is greater than L1 where L is a length scale. Uh, L is basically square root of diffusion uh, diffusion coefficient Ds over this uh, coefficient A, where A is essentially this, uh, you know, the production term DF, uh, del F del U. So uh, he said that, you know, if one was an activator, so A, he considered A11 or U1 to be an activator and U2 to be an inhibitor. And he said that you can have patterns if your diffusion length for, if you have larger diffusion length for inhibitors and you have smaller diffusion lengths for uh, and activators. The activators don't diffuse long, too, too long, but the inhibitors can diffuse in long distance, distances. So it's called, in terms, it's called vocabulary, it's called local activation and long range inhibition. So in long range, there is inhibition. There are stuff that inhibits uh, growth and in locally, there are particles or things that activate. So that this actually helps in um, kind of explaining animal skin coat patterns. Um, but uh, I mean, there are lots of technicalities here. Um, uh, there are, uh, I mean, but this this can explain why there are patterns in you know coats coat markings in animals. He, he, the paper by Turing was called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. And I highly recommend reading this paper because it's a very lucid, it's a very old paper, but it's a very well, uh, very lucid paper. And so, yeah. So what's because interesting I is that a... in that movie, The Imitation Game, yeah. in that movie, actually, they show that after being castrated uh, by the state, Alan Turing is incapable of functioning and he does not do any more research. The funny thing is that his, one of his major contributions, this article itself, yeah. the chemical basis of morphogenesis was written after he was castrated. And it was apparently inspired by the fact that it, so Turing himself thought that he himself is having some bodily changes, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, it, as the myth goes. But uh, the important thing is that this article came after uh, that incident. And in the movie itself, that is completely deleted. It's uh, for probably, uh, I don't know, for effect. Not but if not I understand correctly, what you said. No, no, that's not the what? important thing. The important thing is we are still reading the work, thinking about the work in 2021. It's the work. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think uh, so. Uh, I think it is one of the most pioneering works he did was after that. Uh, uh, Shrikot, I, I would have liked it if the movie showed it. 
Shrikat, I have a question in connection to Turing's paper, and it's not directly related, but uh, do you know of any work that's going on anywhere related to using this kind of tools into uh, form ecological modeling? Like, uh, can we possibly design drugs whereby we use this kind of uh, pre-idea about the patterns, how they are going to propagate to reach certain tissue sites? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know of any work. I, I do yeah, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know I'm work not work sure on the top of my head either. So I, yeah, I don't know. So this, this can be a, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's explore on this because this can be a great idea. I mean, we, uh, through work, like people like you, like this, this tools are so well developed now. There are many open questions in other fields where we can use them very potently. So, what, so is the, what is the idea? Can you, if you can elaborate on the idea? So, 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 so let me give you an example. So most of the times the kind of work that you are showing, you typically yeah. tend to think of a 2D domain, right? 2D, 3D, yeah. Yeah, you can say. I mean, uh, uh, if, even when you are uh, people who are tracking atmospheric transport, because of the aspect ratio, they do make that approximation. Yeah, they make it 2D, yes. So let's, let's, uh, now the problem is, and you are working through your postdoc in a, in, in a new field and uh, you know where the problems are and how stressed the connections might be. But let's think of a uh, certain situation. So let's think about uh, an anatomical organ inside the body. It can be the inside of the heart. It can be the inside of the lungs. It can be the inside of the nose. Uh, yes, it is topologically very complex, uh, yes. but uh, the topology only plays uh, a some role in the transport process, but it is not the dominant factor. So for example, we know that, uh, let me now go back to what I was discussing with Broto yesterday. So inside the nose, we have the mucociliary transport. And uh, it, yes, it is going to be affected by the, uh, the, the topology, but people, uh, the work that is coming out right now, they don't consider that yet because it is just too complex to handle. What they do is they unwrap the entire nasal geometry into this 2D domain. It looks oh, almost okay. like a baghead shell uh, that uh, uh, that's spread out. Uh, you can do that. That kind of uh, surface unwrapping, you can do that with the uh, heart. You can do that with the lungs, etc. So once we have that 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 first layer of reduction, uh, then can we study pattern formation formation of the transport over that over that surface, and and think about a two D domain and you have a certain X T Y T uh, uh, as a target site. So based on your theory, can we predict what is the time scale uh, for the chemicals which are starting from a certain uh, uh, initial location on that surface mm. is going to propagate right, with right. what kind of concentration up there? I don't know of any work like that. And, okay. and this can be a tremendous uh, area to work on over the next few years. So just wanted to let you know if you're yeah, interested. That, yeah, that's that's a really interesting problem. Maybe we can that's the more first, in detail. That's the first question. On slash yeah. comment that I had. Uh, the yeah. second thing is, this is more a non-technical non uh, outlook question that I want from you, is you are working in, the, in, in brain fluid dynamics, right? And you have been working in this yes. area through yeah. your PhD. Uh, yeah, uh, this, this, this work, actually in, my, in the papers I published in the PhD, they are more related with fronts rather than pattern formation in general. But since I actually simulated this system, I had to develop some intuition. And my aim was through this talk just to introduce some vocabulary and some knowledge of these systems. Uh, so, okay, so in the spirit of science and uh, because we have a number of undergraduates on the call. So do you find any kind of interconnecting link between your training and what you are doing now? Yeah, 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 uh, definitely. So, so you can discuss that at the end. Or, yes. or, or if, if, if it fits your uh, storyline now, you can discuss that now as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I have some slides uh, regarding that. And so, so what I will do, if there are no more questions, I will just go ahead and I'll just show, I'll be very brief and just show my highlight, some of my work that I've done in my PhD and go straight to what uh, Basuda said on uh, what I'm doing right now. Okay, so we saw the BZ reaction. So again, fronts in flow fields. So, you know, front can uh, be, so this is a simulation of a forest fire. You see there is a burnt vegetation here and fresh vegetation in green. So this front is propagating unless there, until there is fuel or until there is fresh vegetation. And you, you can have fronts in polymerization in different chemical reactions. 
in most cases, what I did in my PhD was I studied the reaction diffusion system, but I coupled it with a flow field. Now the flow field can be your pattern forming Boussinesque flow field, which is the rayleigh Banard convection. I use rayleigh Banard convection. And the way we couple it is basically we add this advection term that also Brotha was talking about uh, in the yesterday's lecture, where you have u dot grad c is basically the advection, or it means that the flow is basically taking away some of the uh, chemical concentrations. The thing that I studied in my PhD is this coupling and also the fact that there can be feedback. So from the, from the reaction diffusion equation, it can actually change or modify the flow field and there can be feedback. So I also studied that. Um, so essentially you have the Boussinesque equations again. And for feedback to study chemical feedback, I said that you know the chemicals that are uh, reacting, uh, the products and the reactants can have different densities. So what that does is that in the Boussinesque approximation that adds in another linear term, which is because of the chemical composition. So that can show up in the momentum equation as this term called RAS, where RAS is a salutary number. So that's the salutary effect and the heat release. So suppose your chemical reaction is exothermic. So it releases heat. So that feeds into the energy equation by this term and the chemical is the same chemical production term as the reaction diffusion equation. So these are two terms that I added in and then I kind of studied the fronts. So let me just show you some movies. These are, these are without feedback. So no exothermicity or no uh, salutal effect. So these are just fronts propagating in uh, a straight parallel roll flow field. Uh, this black lines here are basically the straight parallel rolls that we sh uh, shown. The middle, uh, the lines are basically P equal to 0.5 contours of them. So we can see the, the ZX plane or uh, this is the top view and this is the side view. We can see that the convection rolls are kind of morphing the front geometry and it's kind of whirling it around uh, the convection roll, the convection cells and it's propagating. So it gives it certain velocity and propagates outward. Now this is for, <coughs> so this, this is at a higher, uh, okay, so I should mention Lewis number. So Lewis number is basically the ratio of two diffusion coefficients. The diffusion coefficient of the actual diffusion coefficient of the chemical species and the thermal diffusivity. So D over alpha, that's what Lewis number is. So it's just a non-dimensional diffusion coefficient. Lower Lewis number uh, values means that Peclet number is larger or your flow has more strength. So you see these images here, the flow has more strength. So it's cusping, the front is actually kind of uh, whirled around by the convection rolls. So that's all that it means. Anyway, so showing you some movies here. So this is a flow field. Again, we are visualizing the temperature of a cylindrical domain. It's at ray number 6,000. This is a state called spiral defect chaos. Uh, it has been, it is a pretty recent phenomenon. It was discovered by Morris in 1993. And there is still some debate of whether this kind of chaotic state exists. But we wrote a paper about it in PR fluids recently. Um, so this is a state at, of spiral defect chaos. Um, what do I mean by chaos? So that's a very important question. And for the undergrads that are sitting here, whenever you see, whenever you, uh, whenever someone says chaotic, what do they mean by that? Because this term gets thrown around uh, literally everywhere. So essentially what we mean is that if we uh, basically linearize or if, if we take the flow field equations, if we take small perturbations of the flow field equations and we see how these perturbations evolve in time, then we can actually say something about the Lyapunov exponents. So the growth rate of those perturbations is called uh, Lyapunov exponents. So for partial differential equations, you get a spectrum of Lyapunov exponents because there are lots of dimensions. So essentially the definition of chaos is that your you must have at least one positive Lyapunov exponent. That's about it. So if you, if you have a system you perturb that system, you add small perturbations to that system, you see how the perturbations equations evolve, and you can then find out the growth rate or the Lyapunov exponent. And if that, if one of the, so if you have a three dimensional ODE, like a Lorentz equation of a three dimensional ordinary differential equation, you will get three Lyapunov exponents. For a partial differential equation, ideally you should get infinite uh, Lyapunov exponents, but since we solve it in a finite domain, we solve a set of ODEs instead and we get a spectrum of Lyapunov exponents. So the definition of chaos 
is that your growth rate of those trajectories is positive or Lyapunov exponent is positive. That's about it. Uh, so anyway, for Rayleigh, Rayleigh number 6,000, we have spiral defect chaos. For Rayleigh number 13,000, you see that the convection rolls are wiggly. So they have kind of some kind of a, a oscillation, a traveling oscillations around it. So this is also interesting. This is a instability that happens. It's called oscillatory instability. Anyway, we can actually study how fronts propagate in these systems. So let's see how the front evolves, right? So for Lewis number one, uh, or for Rayleigh number 6,000 and for Rayleigh number 30,000. Okay, so what we see here is that the front shape, because of the convection rolls are kind of oriented in different directions, it imparts rich geometry to this front interfaces, right? And also these convection rolls, which are wiggly or which are oscillatory, uh, these kind of impart rich uh, geometry to the front interface. And it kind of helps the front in propagating outward in time. So what we did was uh, basically we, we can plot the front velocity, like we can actually track the front or you can use some kind of a sophisticated approach and you can plot it with the fluid velocity. What we saw was that for, uh, for a front that's propagating in a straight parallel roll configuration, where the convection rolls are aligned with the direction of the front, we got a scaling of about 0.31. This is important because when we were studying chaotic systems, we saw that the velocity was actually smaller than uh, the straight parallel rolls. So you might say that chaos actually slows down the fronts. Now, why does that happen? I'll come to that later on. But eventually what happens is if you keep increasing the Rayleigh number, if you keep increasing the Rayleigh number, eventually the fronts in chaotic flow fields takes over the straight parallel rolls. So why does this transition even happen? Or you know, why initially is the chaotic, um, when fronts in chaotic flow fields slower than their counterparts in straight parallel rolls? The answer behind this question is basically the orientation and geometry. Uh, literally. So, you know, you can suppose that there is a front that's propagating outward in this straight parallel roll configuration. And this is a initially circular kind of a front it's propagating outward. It has become re uh, elliptical because convection rolls are aligned in this direction and it helps the front to propagate in this direction. Whereas here, there is no flow. There is no fluid flow. So there, there, the front is not uh, traveling in this direction. So essentially you become uh, an ellipsoid and you can define something called the reaction zone angle, which is the angle between the front, uh, radial direction of the front and the alignment of the wave vectors of the or local wave vectors. So the front is fastest in this direction because the convection rolls are oriented in this direction and it's slowest here and it propagates just with the chemical speed. So anyway, so the orientation matters and what happens in chaotic flow fields is because is that the fronts are oriented at different angles. So again, I'm plotting the colors of the reaction zone angle. You can see that the convection rolls are oriented at different angles away from zero. And convection, a front angle or reaction zone angle of zero helps the front the most, which happens in straight parallel rolls. But in chaotic uh, patterns, you have uh, wave uh, numbers or wave vectors are different kind of uh, wave vectors. So the patterns are kind of uh, you know, spread out and it kind of the, the velocity of the front locally, uh, sometimes it gets decelerated or accelerated, which can be shown here as well. Here, you know, for daily number 3000, we can plot the velocity as a function of the reaction zone angle. We see that there's a weak trend uh, for higher values of daily number where the reaction zone angles are kind of spread out more. We see that the velocities are kind of uniformly distributed from zero to pi over two. Uh, reaction zone angle, by the way, is defined from zero to pi over two. That's how I defined it. But um, essentially what we get is uh, what, what the answer to first part of the question is why chaotic front, fronts in chaotic flow fields are slower than uh, in straight parallel rolls is the reaction zone angle, basically. The second part of the question is why they become faster. Uh, I mean, firstly, the fluid velocity becomes faster once you keep increasing the Rayleigh number but also this uh, rich uh, 3D geometry of the front. So this is a three dimensional uh, movie of my simulation. And you can see that the front interface is very uh, complex and intricate, right? 
And so you can actually take slices of this front and you, what you can do is compute a fractal dimension. Okay, so uh, for people who may not be familiar with box counting dimension or fractal, fractals in general, uh, you can Google fractals and you can come up with a lot of interesting ideas and pictures. But what I used was the box counting dimension. What this means is that suppose you are, uh, you are lying down on your roof, rooftop and you are watching the clouds above you and you pick a certain cloud, you draw a perimeter on, of, that cloud, of that cloud, right? So that perimeter, let's say, is L. Now, some, somehow, you have levitated towards that, towards that cloud, and you draw the perimeter again. Now, you will capture small-scale structures, which you didn't capture the last time, right? So your perimeter eventually will become bigger than you calculated previously. And this will happen as, as close as you are going to the cloud. You'll capture more and more small scale structures. So this is uh, what, it, it, what, what is known to be a fractal in nature. It's a natural fractal, geometrical object, which has a dimension with non-integer dimension. So what we do is basically for box counting, we computationally, we take this image, we pad it with a number of boxes, and we consistently decrease the size of the boxes. And we count the number of boxes that captures the image and the size of the boxes. And we get some kind of a dimension. And this dimension shows us, a small, quantitatively, it gives us an idea of the number of, of the small scale structures that the front interface has. So uh, the front, I, the box counting dimension, we found that it increases with the Rayleigh number and uh, you know, and uh, basically for these green points are after that oscillatory instability where the box on dimension increases even more. So what we found is that for these, these fronts, uh, for higher values of Rayleigh number, because of the oscillatory instability of the convection rolls, small scale structures are added, which help in the reaction and the reaction front becomes eventually faster. So in uh, summary, slowing down of the reaction is because of the orientation of the convection rolls and fastening of the reaction or uh, reaction front or the reaction front becomes faster in time than their counterparts in straight parallels because of the fractal front interface. Okay, that's about my first part of the research. Uh, the second part is feedback where I study exothermic reactions and solutal feedbacks. And a large amount of this work can be found in this uh, lab nonlinear physical chemistry unit in ULB Brussels, where Lauren Strongy and Anne DeWitt, uh, brilliant scientists, they have done a bunch of work in this field. What um, I did was, let's, let's consider salutal feedback. So what is a salutal feedback is basically when you have a reaction front and here there is no flow, so RS of zero. As you increase the salutal Rayleigh number, I'm saying that the products in red are lighter than the reactants in blue. So what happens is that the front tilts and it develops a flow field around it. So this is what is known as salutal feedback, essentially. And the, it is de defined by a Rayleigh number like quantity. It's called the salutal Rayleigh number in the equation. So you have this large counterclockwise rotating convection roll that propagates. And the products, which are lighter, they scooch up and the reactants scooch down. And you have this front that's propagating outward. That's what is salutal feedback is. And there is no background convection here. But you know, I uh, analyzed this, uh, we analyzed this and we used some, uh, I'm not going into details, but we did some perturbation analysis in this, in this problem. Um, and I can show you some, another, some pretty pictures again. And this is salutal feedback with a bunch of convection rolls. So what happens in, when there is convection is that uh, because of the convective instability, the front is whirled around the convection rolls but the products now are lighter than the reactants. So what happens is that there, there is an instability by which the products actually grow out and they become larger in shape because the products are lighter than the reactant. So they, are, they resist uh, being whirled around by the convection rolls and they become like stretched. So they become stretched, they kill the convection locally. So you can see in this region, there is no convection and the convection rolls re-emerge behind it. So you have convection rolls again re-emerging. So I can show you a, a movie of the simulation for this parameter. 
and you can see that the cellular feedback as it's propagating, it's killing the convection rolls, it's galloping as if, and the convection rolls again reemerge because remember this fluid is convectively unstable. We have a we are in a Rayleigh number regime which is above the critical Rayleigh number. So that's what I did again uh, in terms of cellular feedback. Uh, yeah, so I should just show you this. Uh, this is something called the space-time plot, which we use to kind of uh, study patterns. So you have a structure that's propagating in time. We take a slice of time, a slice in the x-axis, and we see how the patterns evolve. Space-time plots are very intuitive, and they help us in uh, studying the patterns and what the patterns are, uh, how the patterns are. So, for example, uh, let's say for this case, uh, there is a diagonal, almost diagonal line that separates the products and the reactants. We are plotting, uh, so this is a evolving front, right? We take a slice here in the mid plane. So the front is a function of X and T and we plot the front in colors of uh, the concentration and X is in the X axis and T time is in the Y axis. So for this front where there is no convection, we see that a smooth transition from reactants to products. If you take any slice in X, you will smoothly go from products to reactants, right? From monotonically. For this front, when there is convection, but there is no solute effect, you will again, if you take slices here, these lines are convection roll centers, by the way, uh, for reference, you will again grow monotonically from products to reactants. But when you have solute instability, what you'll have is these patterns. And if you take certain slices in X, you will find that the concentration like if you take this slice here in X, you'll find the concentration in time axis actually goes from you know blue to green to red, then again slightly lighter red, then deeper red. So it's kind of oscillating in time. Concentration is oscillating in time. So this is like a temporal oscillation in uh, concentration, which is an emergent phenomenon. And uh, this is similar to Belus of Zab what happens in Belus of Zabotinsky reaction but we can actually more or kind of study this quantitative qual qualitatively from our set of equations from the Buzanesk equation with the chemical feedback. Okay, so let me just give you a brief idea of thermal feedback. What happens in thermal feedback is that you get a pair of convection rolls. Instead of the large counterclockwise rotating convection rolls, you get a pair of convection rolls uh, because there is a, so this reaction here is exothermic. So it releases heat the release of heat, uh, basically uh, the hot fluid here goes up and it has to descend down. And because of the incompressibility condition, you get a pair of convection rolls uh, because of the heat release, the exothermicity. So uh, I'll just skip all this. Uh, these are cooperative and antagonistic. I just don't wanna go into too much detail of, on this. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that's thermal feedback. We saw solutal feedback. Okay, so let's let's do solutal and thermal feedback in a very chaotic, uh, in a chaotic flow field. So for Rayleigh number 6,000, this front does not have any feedback, right? So it's just propagating outward. It's getting, the geometry is getting modified because of the convection rolls. For this front, we have a solutal feedback. So basically the convection rolls are here annihilated and they reform and they form this kind of very large wave number structures here. Uh, this is for antagonistic feedback on cooperative, which are different kinds of feedback here, but essentially the wave number that form the, the because of the front, the wave number that forms here is about 3.8, which is way large. And the wave number selected by the target pattern is actually outside the Busa balloon. So it quickly reverts back to this stable uh, configuration. So this, this wave number is a very local temporal kind of a thing, which quickly reverts back because it wants to get inside the stability region of the balloon. I can show you a movie, it's a pretty movie. You see, as the front is propagating, it's adjusting the convection rolls such that they become target patterns. It's, it, this, this striped pattern is called a target pattern. And you know the target pattern then again, readjusts and goes back to that pattern again. So I'll end with a front, which is called pattern forming front. Now you can also have pattern forming front where, where you know, this is a convection layer and you do some kind of a initial perturbation here and you will have convection rolls that form 
and that will kind of eventually invade the system in time as time propagates, uh, right? So you have a convection roll. So this is a example of a convection roll pattern. And I have also studied that in my thesis. Okay, so I'll end it there and just show you some of the present projects like Basuda was talking about in t -Hop Lab. So essentially what I'm doing right now is also reaction diffusion systems. So uh, over the last decade in neuroscience, there has been a lot of progress. And currently people are focused on the role of fluid flow in the, in the, in the, in the brain, in the mammalian brain. So by fluid flow, I mean, the, there are two kinds of fluids that are in the brain ma majorly. One is the blood flow that flows through the vasculature in the brain. And then the one is the cerebrospinal fluid, which is basically water. It's essentially water that flows through, uh, flows in the brain. So initially, pre previously people used to believe that cerebrospinal fluid does not have any motion. But uh, over the last decade, people have found that cerebrospinal fluid in the brain actually flows and it helps in the clearance of the waste products in the brain. So, and it flows through this annular ducts surrounding the arteries and the veins. So this red structure here is the artery and this annular structure here is called perivascular space through which the cerebrospinal fluid moves. So, uh, so for what I am interested in is how the cerebrospinal fluid kind of you know, seeps into these tissues and clears out waste products. So I do a reaction diffusion system again, and I solve it in an idealized computational geometry and I get some uh, results. That's what I'm kind of focused on now. This is one aspect of my research. And the second is spreading depolarization. So there is something that happens in the brain which is called spreading depolarization. It's, uh, it happens after a traumatic brain injury. Some, if someone hits you in the brain pretty hard or it might happen during migraine aura if you if someone has a has, has migraine, so you ha, you get a flash of light in your eyes. So basically, what spread depolarization is is a chemical imbalance at a chemical front that propagates in the brain cortex. So it's a you know the, your neurons basically consistently are in a chemical non equilibrium state. So it basically the neuronal membrane uh, constantly fluxes out potassium, calcium, and fluoride. To maintain a chemical non-equilibrium state, which helps in uh, basically relaying messages. So what I'm talking, what you are listening, this is all because of the neuron firing. Sometimes neurons fire abnormally, and you can get this kind of a chemical uh, front that's propagating outward. So I'm also using reaction diffusion systems to study this. Uh, if this movie plays, let's see. So this is just a, another chemical front uh, that I'm that I simulated using. Is actually the concentration of potassium in a domain. So that's the present project. And I'll actually leave at that and take questions if you are, if I have any yeah. concluding so, questions. I've gone way over time, I know, but. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, talk to our younger audience members and see uh, what they think. Uh, so Onik. Uh... Onik, uh, Srobon and Arnob. Yeah. Onyx Shobon Ornob. Yeah. Yes, uh, Shrekotta, can you repeat this uh, stroke phenomena once more? The, uh, the spreading depolarization, this one? Yes, yes. Oh, so what happens is, uh, so neurons are consistently, uh, you know, are in chemical non-equilibrium state. So basically, uh, the neuronal, across the neuronal membrane, you have fluxes of potassium, chloride, and ions and stuff like that. And it's a chemical reservoir. It's like small batteries in your brain that kind of charge, that are charged batteries that help in passing uh, signals. So the signals that we say, the electric signals, it's actually a chemoelectric phenomenon. So the, it's actually, these are chemicals that, you know, go on and off uh, between the neural and membrane and uh, basically release, you have charges. So th this is important for our brain to kind of function. But what happens is during stroke, during migraine, or even during uh, a traumatic brain injury, uh, the neurons misfire, or they, they may end up uh, misfiring a lot of uh, potassium or a lot of uh, chloride outside the neural membrane. What happens then is that this chemical wave propagates outward, and it kind of, uh, it, it propagates uh, and basically misfire, and the misfiring continues. 
So as the front propagates, more and more neurons misfire again. And this kind of repeats and repeats un until and unless there is a relaxation. And uh, that, that this phenomenon is called spreading depolarization. Basically, if, is, was that clear? Shrobon, I guess, right? So, I don't know who asked me the question. I think Strobon got disconnected again. Maybe it's it's a problem of Zoom. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. yes. I I asked the question. Sorry, did did you uh, and don't say it? sir? Yeah, don't say sir. Did you, did you listen to the answer, Strobon? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. okay, great. So you know, interesting phenomenon. Uh, this spreading depolarization. So the, these are pictures from mice brain. So most of the experiments are carried out in mice, pigs as well. Interesting phenomenon is when a person dies. Actually, the spreading depolarization uh, happens during death. And during death, the strain depolarization wave, uh, the neurons never relax. So it kills all the neuronal activity. And that's also a spreading depolarization phenomenon. Because what is the FR term here? So FR is a very, uh, I mean, coupled um, term of, I mean, the, uh, the potassium formation term, as well as it, uh, it is a term that uh, also includes other uh, chemicals, right? So, uh, which are associated with oh, ionic so, pumps, ionic pumps okay. in the neuronal membrane. So basically, ion okay, pumps. So, okay, okay. Yep. So it's basically a chemical equation. It doesn't have any uh, transport term as such, right? Uh, diffusion happens. Diffusion is there. Okay. So that's about uh, what my research entails and a uh, little or probably a very large discussion on pattern formation. I have a question. What is this uh, SIK term here? Uh... Okay, so that's a good question. The IK is actually a current. Um, I stands for a current here. And this current is also associated with uh, the potassium current. So, you know, the, the when the potassium concentration is different between uh, outside and inside the cell membrane, it there there is a current term that happens and that, uh, that term is basically IK. And the so this is a uh, I, ionic equation for potassium ion. So there is diffusion, there is this current term and there's this function, which is basically the ion pumps, the other pumps that come into the picture and the ion gates gates and pumps are captured by the fr term um, yeah so the fr term is a source term and it is a it is uh, a then, yeah it is a it it, so it there's can, a diffusion yeah. term there's a source term and is this S, uh, uh, sik is also a uh, also it's kind a of source, source term. term yeah because it's not SIK an advection term there's no velocity so yeah. both of them are source terms but of two different origins i see yeah All right, does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, no, uh, I think uh, Chanunda has a question. Yeah, yeah Shrikot has a question. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Shrikot, I have Shrikot a question. So for this particular equation, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, <clears throat> you don't need to consider the system geometry, right? It is more like a compartmental modeling equation. Yeah, yeah. In, in brain, that's what people use generally, compartmental modeling. Um, so we, we are still uh, doing it. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very new problem that I'm, I've been doing since the last couple of months uh, or three months. But essentially, uh, here I have just solved this reaction diffusion equation in a square with six millimeter times six millimeter. So you can okay. consider a six millimeter constant cross section of the brain tissue itself. And it also, we are not considering the depth. So it's just a two dimensional slice. Consider two dimensional slices. So, so now, is there any is there any war going on in the community where they maybe are trying to get MRI scans of brain and trying to come yeah, up yeah. with that kind of geometry? Yeah, the, I mean there are lots of uh, work on spin depolarization using scans and other kinds of imageries where they have also quantified the you know the speed of the front, the kind of uh, how how the uh, front propagates and. All that, all those kind of questions, and you can actually have Belusov Zabotinsky kind of patterns in strain depolarization. It's very okay. interesting. But for me, I'm just starting off with this very simple equation, 
and mm-hmm. i'm just i'm just starting off and uh, what essentially we will do is um, couple this with the with the cerebrospinal fluid flow that's okay. happening okay okay. Yeah. okay thanks uh, so you got so you okay yeah. sorry someone please uh, uh, i still still didn't understand the difference between the i k term and f of f of r term means uh, yeah so the ik is basically the current uh, for potassium uh, yeah. that's getting generated because the potassium concentrations inside and outside the neurons are different okay difference in you know difference in concentration the current is generating yes yes and fr actually is uh, i shouldn't have probably written it as fri because there were lots of complicated terms i just uh, consolidated them to one uh, source term but it's essentially it's a term that uh, has a lot of uh, uh, gates and pumps there are lots of interesting things that happen in a neuron when a neuron fires so all that is uh, kind of contained in fr okay okay so you got chan chandon here so yes. i was actually curious uh, could you please tell us like in the experiment with mice or whatever species they are considering yeah. so how they actually mimic this uh, depolarization scenario to mm. do the experiment they basically just hit the mice so firstly they anesthetize okay. the mice the mice is um, now basically anesthetized they do a they just hit the top of the head with a hammer pretty much they either either do that or they can uh, they can also uh, put put in some beads Uh, through the cerebrospinal fluid and that bead what that bead does is basically induces a stroke in the brain because it stops the pumping of the blood or something you not know, through the vasculature induces a stroke and then you have this sort of depolarization again i see and the second question was like uh, you are modeling uh, this phenomena so how are you uh, planning to you know validate the experimental findings so in what terms so what, first first thing that i will look at is speed uh if i get uh comparable front speeds as expi- as in experiments and secondly i will so these are all dimensional equations so you can see this is a dimensional yes, domain yes. and the concentration is also in dimensional quantities so i flow is basically the depth average of the horizontal fluid flow velocity so what happens is that you can see the velocity vectors are actually in the direction of the is in the opposite direction of the spiral so it's as if it's unfurling unfurling the spiral so yeah just more patterns and ways to quantify them and ways to understand how this that pattern kind of evolves okay so i just wanted to end with the idea of vanguard i think it's very similar to a reaction diffusion system because you have knowledge and we have we have some knowledge i i i'm not claiming we have all the knowledge in the world but we have some knowledge which we want to spread out and make science accessible to everyone <laughs> and everyone is a broad definition so we want to diffuse it and we want to generate new ideas and possibilities so we have a reaction term as well so essentially the idea of vanguard is just a reaction diffusion equation so i'll just end with that this is the equation of democratization of knowledge yes absolutely something like that wonderful